virus is not going to sink the American economy. What is or could sink the American economy is the socialism coming from our friends on the other side of the aisle. That's the biggest fear that I have. No one seems to really want to discuss this right now, but uh, what what role did the rise of Bernie Sanders play, in the, if we're really going to talk about this, in the dropping stock market? Does anyone think that Bernie Sanders will be good for investment, good for business, good for entrepreneurship? Of course not. There's no, there's no way. Um, but then that brings me to uh, where I think the coronavirus situation is going. I, I meant to get to this before, and then I got distracted by Maybe I'll reach out. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to try to have uh, O'Keefe on. We could talk about what what his parameters are for uh, undercover journalism is now taping people complaining about their boss and like saying that the media is liberal. Okay, Uh, I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm just saying I don't I don't really think it's I don't think that that was particularly helpful or I don't really care all that much. I mean, it's interesting insofar as, yeah, they're a bunch of socialist libs. But anyway, uh I feel like I feel like everybody should already know that, but maybe people don't know that. Maybe that's what it's really all about. What's happening now with the uh, with the spread of coronavirus? I mean, I would say um, very few people recognize that we've already had, I think, almost six thousand deaths in the U.S. from influenza this season. It's a lot of people. Certainly, I think it's, it's I think it's over five thousand so far, and that would if you were to do a a run rate of how many people would have to die per day of coronavirus for the next 60 days. I mean, we'd have to see a huge spike in cases and in fatalities. And the overall, the, the big part of this that has gotten people so worked up and so concerned is that there are, uh, there, there's a fatality, or mortality rate is what they like to say. Mortality rate, or that's the preferred term, I say fatality. Uh, mortality rate of 2%, which is considerably higher than 0. 0.0. One percent. Um, okay, but that assumes that you know. You know, if you're looking at a fraction, you, you have to know what the denominator is, right? If you're looking at this, trying to establish what the percentage of those who die who get the disease is, I would just say that uh, the number of cases is probably, especially in China, is probably much higher than what is reported. And I'm not even saying there's necessarily a government suppression effort at work here, although that's certainly possible. Uh, the number of cases, as I'm, you know, that I'm, when I'm talking about this, the number of cases would be um, something that people just don't even necessarily know that they have. That is, a lot of people are asymptomatic. A lot, of, a lot of individuals have already been reported to have very, very mild symptoms. So, you know, this is such a test, I think, in this country of our ability To put us, and right now we're failing the test as a country, at least, I mean, the Democrats are, uh, because there's been really no good faith. Okay, hey, this is a scary moment. Let's let's try to see how this goes. Let's push the president in the right direction, come up with ideas, and we can do that. We can do the pointing fingers once we know what we're dealing with, but that's they've gone in the totally opposite direction, score points right away. Got to score those points right away against the president and just and and drive down, you know, they, they create this fear. Or rather, I should I shouldn't say they create the fear. Let me let me edit that. They greatly magnify, I would say, recklessly magnify the fears over what this is going to do to the country, and then they point to the stock market and say, "See, the stock market's dropping, so Trump isn't really that great." Okay, well, fine. Um, the stock market. We were told when Trump was doing really well with it was the Obama stock market, right? So this is what I mean when I tell you that there are no principles that they will adhere to. There is no truth that is constant with them. Everything shifts depending on the political needs of the left at any point in time. And yeah, I mean, here, here we go. Uh, when we look at this, we find ourselves in a situation that we can't trust a lot of the people that are bringing us information on it because they come with, uh, they come with an agenda. Um, I think it is a fair statement, although Democrats would completely lose their minds right now, to say that socialism is a bigger threat to the American economy than coronavirus is. I think that's true. Right now, that might feel like a bit of an extreme statement, but I think that it is, it is accurate. Um, oh, do, I don't think we've even played it. This is the, do we, uh, Producer Mark, can we play the soundbite of Trump actually saying that it's what he said about hoax. And keep in mind, this was the first thing I'm asked about on the Bill Maher Show Friday, is Trump called this a hoax. I'm like, he didn't call it a hoax. Play it. Now the Democrats are politicizing the 
coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. They are politicizing it. We did one of the great jobs, you say, House President Trump doing. They go, oh, not good, not good. <laughs> they have no clue. They don't have any clue. They can't even count their votes in Iowa. They can't even count. <laughs> they can't count their votes. One of my people came up to me and said, Mr. President, they tried to beat you on Russia, Russia, Russia. That didn't work out too well. They couldn't do it. They tried the impeachment hoax. That was on a perfect conversation. They tried anything. They tried it over and over. They've been doing it since you got in. It's all turning. They lost. It's all turning. Think of it. Think of it. And this is their new hoax. Is he saying there's no coronavirus? Or is he saying that their new hoax is pretending that Trump is failing to deal with this and that this is a disaster because of Trump? Come on. Oh, he said that he said coronavirus is a hoax. This is when this is the 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 lib hyper literalism routine. This is what they do. They they all of a sudden lose the ability to gauge the English language and 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 to understand what words actually mean, and they replace it with, um, they replace it with this. You know, they replace it with telling us that what all of us can understand was being said by the president is not what he said. Coronavirus is a hoax. Yeah, because coronavirus doesn't exist is what he's saying. I mean, this is this is idiocy. I did want to just take a moment because there was this uh, new story of the week. It didn't get a lot of attention. I think it should get a lot more attention than it does. And it has to do with uh, Afghanistan. Um, the president is very clear on one principle here about about our role in national security and around the world. Mark, play clip A, please. But American forces cannot be the policemen for the entire world. We're all over the world. And a lot of times we're not even appreciated. It's taken for granted. We can't be the policemen for the world. And the democracy builders, we just can't do that for every nation that seems to have difficulty especially for those nations that don't appreciate what we do. And there are many of them, many of them. And that goes with trade also. We've changed the whole thing around. Their job is to be secure, and my job is to make sure that we're secure and to defend our country first, our country. So Afghanistan right now is in a, is in a very important moment the president has and I, I play that for you just because this is the way he's trying to approach foreign policy and i think it's the right way and i, I especially like his point about how you know, countries don't even really appreciate it i mean there's a lot of remember america the way you and i see america is very different than it's seen in, in other parts of the world especially poorer more violent um you know poor more violent places that don't have as much to celebrate as nation states as we do just aren't as successful as countries as America is. That's, that's the, the truth of what's going on. They don't necessarily say, oh, great, America's trying to help us advance, produce more, be safer, have you know, representative government, have rule of law. A lot of, a lot of the time, there's at least some loud and sometimes very violent minority within these countries that uh, say that what we're doing is imperialist and we shouldn't be there and you know, there's not enough support from the people to drown out those voices. So why are we? It's it's really a thankless job trying to help these countries be better than they are. I'm talking about Iraq, Afghanistan. So we shouldn't do this job anymore. And also, it's thankless, and it's I think eventually we'll recognize that it's does not have the outcomes that we want either. So that's what I would say. I would just point out that there's not really a. Um, you know, there's not an end state here that anybody's going to be able to celebrate. So we have a deal with the Taliban that was uh, that was shown. They've released the the text of it, I think, uh, on Friday, and it has these confidence building measures, secession secession of violence, and then there are these different steps. And if we hit all those different steps, the U.S. is going to withdraw all troops. I think within an 18 month period is what it said. And everyone's claiming, you know, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. There's not going to be a good deal. Everyone, never, everyone needs, I'm, I'm just here to just tell it like it is. There's not going to be a good deal. We have no, there is no plan, there's no future, there's no reality in which we are eradicating the Taliban. The Taliban are ascendant in Afghanistan. They have been for years now. And they're not going anywhere. And we're tired of this. So even if this is a, a withdrawal plan 
that you know, look, the, the the problem with the there are a lot of reasons why the Obama because I know this is what's going to happen. It immediately turns into a what about Obama and Iraq? Uh, the Obama administration pulled out of a country that had a developed enough national infrastructure, military, and security apparatus that there was a realistic chance of Iraq not having what happened happened, which is you know the ISIS flooding in, taking Mosul almost making it to the outskirts of Baghdad, threatening the Kurdish areas, this huge terrorist army coming in and doing all that. Uh, that didn't, that didn't, that wasn't inevitable. The Taliban being in charge of, or at least a, a powerful voice in Afghan politics, if not in fact the ruling party of that country, um, the Taliban is going to be a powerful force politically, militarily, and perhaps will become once again the, the primary force uh, in Afghanistan, that's there's no the only way around that is to is to stay there and be there for the next fifty years, and who knows what fifty years will bring? Do we really want to do that? As long as the Taliban is not a safe haven for terrorists, how much is it really supposed to matter? I know this starts to be oh, are we allowed? To, how much is it really sp- supposed to matter to us? Who is in charge there? It's a real question. People don't like to ask that question. Why are we supposed to care so much? Who is in charge in this country that is very far away, in which our real interest is just don't become a training ground and funding source for people that want to fly planes into our buildings. That's why we were there. We were not there because there was this uh, desire to make Afghanistan a Jeffersonian democracy in Southwest Asia. And that's what it became. So if we fulfill that initial objective, and also, I mean, I would assume, I'm not sure what the Trump team is telling them, but it's pretty clear to anybody paying attention that if the, if Afghanistan was in fact used again as a platform for jihad in this way, um, then we would go back and the response would be severe. Uh, it would be severe. I, I think the United States would would find itself in a position where we don't really care all that much about what is destroyed and, and what the cost is. I mean, I'm just saying, if we got hit again like we did on 9-11, I think we'd go back and say, all right, you know, Anybody who's not on our team, we're just going to wipe them all out. Taliban, you know, it, it, it's just, I, I'm hoping we never reach that, that phase. Um, but I think that the administration is right to just try to get the U.S. military out of there. It's not, it's just not, at some point, it's just not our fight anymore. We've, we've stood up and at, there is an Afghan national army. There's an Afghan national police. There's, you know, they've had elections. We, we've, we've gone through all this. What are we really supposed to do? Just keep propping this country up as long as we possibly can? Uh, I think the Trump... Now, there's already been a, a break in the... Uh, the Taliban has already broken this the ceasefire. There's been violence. So who knows if this agreement will even last in any meaningful way. But I, I agree with Trump that overall this is, this is the correct approach and we should leave Afghanistan. And kind of come what may there. And just let them know that, look, we've got... A lot of ways to do a lot of things there without having eight or 9,000 U.S. troops that are holding this country together. Think about that. Why, why are eight or 9,000 U.S. troops able to hold this whole place together? And if we go, the whole thing collapses. What does that say about the state of the Afghan military, the Afghan government? It's pretty astonishing. So we shall continue to follow this. And maybe tomorrow I'll talk to you about what's going on between the Turks and the Syrians in northern Syria, which is also completely overshadowed right now by the coronavirus situation, but very interesting, uh, troubling stuff going on in Syria, too. All right, so drag queen story hour is something that conservatives talk about. And there's a lot of video going around social media right now of that. So drag queen story hour is... And I need to dig more into how this even became a recurring uh, a, a thing that just keeps happening. There are clearly people that think that this is a good idea. It's men who are dressed as women. That is what a drag queen is, right? Men who are dressed as women who are going and doing storybook reads to rooms full of very small children, like five, six, seven-year-olds. And saying things to them. I mean, this was a video. I, I almost, I keep thinking, is this a deep fake or are these, is this real? Am I going to find out that this wasn't what I thought it was? But he, here's just some of the audio, and you can imagine what the video is like. The video is circulating around the internet, too. Play it, uh, Mark. 
There's funny little dances from Fortnite. Does anybody know any of the dances from Fortnite? Oh, then you are a credit to your community. <laughs> but most of all, Michael likes to twerk. Now, does anybody in this room know how to twerk? Okay, well, it's quite important to the story, so I will just give you a very quick demonstration. <laughs> All you need to do is you just stand with your feet sort of shoulder width apart, like so. Okay, and I'll, sh I'll show you at the side, so you get better view. There we go. And you, you crouch down into this sort of position here, so your thumb's sticking out. Don't be taking this all in. <laughs> and then you just move your thumb up and down like that, and that's twerking. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it a? I mean, twerking is a pretty, uh, you know, pretty sexualized dance movement. I, mean, I know I sound like maybe somebody from the movie Footloose or something here, but you know, twerking is a particularly for, for little kids. For an adult male dresses a woman to be showing a room full of small kids how to twerk. I looked this up by the way. Uh, DragQueenStoryHour.org says it's drag queens reading stories to children in libraries, schools, and bookstores. In spaces like this, kids are able to see people who defy rigid gender restrictions and imagine a world where people can present as they wish where dress up is is real uh, this started in 2015 by actor and activist uh i'm sorry author and activist michelle t um this is so this is a real this is a movement now uh you know i i just do, do we no long, so it no longer applies. Like I mean, these are really small children who are being told about twerking. If if I let's just let's just make this very clear. If I, as an adult male dressed as a male, presenting as a male, went into a room full of four year old boys and girls and started saying, "Hey, like this is how you twerk," and gyrating my butt up and down during during like story time, people would think that was weird. Rightfully so, people would say well, is that that's a little sexualized, isn't it, for the, for this audience, for these kids? Why do we have to accept that there are different standards for adults when they're presenting some form of the left wing, you know, trans or or gender gender fluid uh, agenda? Why do the rules change? I, by the way, I don't. People can dress however they want. They can present however they want. I don't care. But I just want to know, why are the rules when it comes to what's appropriate for adults to do in front of children all of a sudden markedly different? Do I, do I, can I ever get an explanation of that? Does anyone ever have to address that issue? I mean, I think we know the answer is no, of course not. Whatever they want to do is, is, uh, is fine, but we'll see. Um, we'll see what ends up happening with this if it, if it continues on. It's hard to believe, especially you have to see the visual. I know I'm telling you this on, on radio or podcast, unless you're watching on Pluto TV. But if you see the, vid the video, you say, um, I don't think this is appropriate for my kids or any kids. It's time for roll call. All right, let's get to it. Facebook.com slash Buck Sexton. Uh, team Buck at iHeartMedia.com if you want to send emails. Good to hear from you, team, because after doing Bill Maher's show on Friday, uh, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, like, super... Nasty stuff coming my way. I mean, you know, you, you know, everyone will tell you they get used to it. You never really get used to it. It's not, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, I especially love it too when all the people, all they want to do is tell me uh, on, you know, a lot of these libs, the first thing they always want to tell me how ugly I am, which I think is interesting because, okay, I'm, I'm just there to have a political conversation. I'm, I'm trying to like present as a professional. I mean, I'm not, I'm not showing up trying to be a, an Armani underwear model. Um, but would they, do they say that to like, I mean, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, is is like Nicholas Kristoff super handsome? I mean, like, like what, what? Oh, only if you disagree with someone, then them being ugly is all. I mean, is is Bill Maher super handsome? Like, I, I just want to know where we draw the lines here about that. I think it's interesting. There's a lot of the 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 primary response to me going on Bill Maher is um is I should be embarrassed at how ugly I am, which I think is an interesting. Oh, and the stuff about your name is hilarious too. Well, no, but that that's like, that's always fun because this is a, the mark of somebody who's really dumb. Like they the think they're the first person that's made the, it's, it sounds like a porn star name joke. No, like, that's why been made even, a million times. No, but, that, yeah. but like, so why even, why even make that sure. particular joke when like, it's so, you know, there is such a thing as like the joke that you don't make because everyone's gonna, it's like, ah, 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 like it's so dumb, but no, these people, so it's a fun, it's a fun intelligence test that libs fail all the time. Like I will I, say though. By the way, you know who made fun of my name 
uh, the first time I ever did his show and laughed at his own joke was Don Lemon because he's a moron. He's actually stupid. So, yeah. What were you going to say? I was just saying it brightened my Friday night. It made my train ride go very quickly. Producer Mark enjoyed just, me getting uh, me getting trashed uh, by everybody, apparently. I mean, so that's, you have to laugh at it. If you I don't guess. laugh, you're gonna, what are you going to cry? These people I mean, are total. Nah, of course. These people exactly. are total, total psychos, but, man. And now I'm getting now I'm getting a pile I'm getting piled on too because I said that I don't like James O'Keefe typing I mean taping journalists who are off the clock giving their thoughts about you know politics. I mean, some I, of the people he's taped are like the equivalent of me. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. They're wrong. These people are not very smart. Taping somebody who's like a low level employee. Not that you're low level, Bruce Mark. Wow. We love you. Wow. But I'm saying taping somebody as he has like he's taped like associate producers at CNN and like, yeah, like, we don't do a good job, you know, getting... And then they get fired. I mean, we're, we're supposed to, like, that's so cool, that's so brave. No. Get into Jeff Zucker's office or somebody... I know the top executive at CNN. I used to know who all of them were. Get in one of their offices and maybe get them saying that they're unfair to Trump. That's meaningful. Getting some, like, uh, person that's just trying to, you know, keep a job for, for as long as they... I mean, it's... Anyway. It was, oh, you're being a sellout. No, I'm just not a... It's not a punk. I don't go on TV and say different things to different audiences because I, anyway, you guys all know. Oi, speaking truth, man. People say they want the truth, but a lot of people don't. Matthew. Hey, Buck, on the subject of plastic bags, I grew up during the 80s and 90s and could have swore I remembered a movement promoting plastic bags because environmentalists were crying about the use of paper bags contributing to the clear cutting of the rainforest or something like that. No one ever brings this up, but I could have sworn this was a thing whenever I was growing up. Of course, it's all bull crap, but still, it's like no matter what we can do, we can't ever make the, these wackos happy. Anyway, love the show. Bruce your Mark is awesome. Shields high. Uh, yeah, Matthew, you're never going to make these, um, these people happy. And the environmentalists, like, it's a religion. I mean, this is all about how people feel. It really has nothing to do how how saying and taking these positions um how it makes individuals feel and that's kind of it so yeah sarah buck when the coronavirus first started hitting the news cycle some doctor came out and said it was a completely manageable virus he claimed that massive doses of vitamin c were all that was necessary to fight it off and no one should die from contracting the disease i know there is a lot of fake news out there could it be so simple there is a sense that a crisis is a viable tool in the hands of the unscrupulous government. Um, Sarah, I mean, I would never, I'm not a doctor. I would never give that kind of advice. I, I wouldn't give medical advice of any kind on this show. Um, and I do not find that to be credible. Um, you know, people have all these, oh yeah, this will like make you not get, this will treat your cold faster. And I've tried all these different things. If there were an answer, we would know what the answer is. That's usually the case, especially with something that's as common as, as, as the common cold. That's why they call it the common cold. Good job, Buck. Uh, but yeah, this is um, this is I, I think uh, a time when you have to be very careful where you're getting your information. You know who you're getting your information from. I think that really matters. Um, Tommy, the last time I was asked in a job interview, "What's your biggest weakness?" I answered, "My biggest weakness is the lie I am about to tell you." Tommy, I think that's a totally respectful way to answer that very dumb question, and it always says more to me about the interviewer. Anyone who asks that in an interview and their judgment that it does it, how, however the person answers that, I think should kind of get wiped away because the person asking the question hasn't figured out that's a really stupid question that somehow people just can't, uh, we, we can't get past this in the HR world. You know, you can't get past it. Oh, what would you say your biggest weakness is? John writes, Buck, coming at you from the great liberal stronghold of Central Coast, California. Your show is the best. It's very educational. However, I need to push back on the plastic bag ban. Putting everything to the side, it's nice not to not see those things floating around in the air and sticking to the trees and bushes, and I've gotten used to carrying the reusables around. The plastic straw and single-use container bans are stupid. Also, global warming is a hoax. Our records only go back a short period of time. It's like judging your, your whole day off of one second. Um, yes, John, that's true. It's ridiculous. Uh, global warming is not what people say it is. But I got to push back on you on the plastic bag ban because what you are talking about is littering. And if you want to get rid of littering, that's a separate thing than to ban something for environmental reasons. I think that littering uh, should be, you know, people should be fined for this. I think that the police, 
The same way that, you know, if you drive 130 miles an hour on the highway and you go past a cop, the cop's like, I don't care you haven't, you know, run into anybody yet or caused an accident. I'm going to give you a ticket. I think that littering should be something that we punish. Uh, I think that you should get fined for it. It's really bad. Culturally, by the way, America is quite good about not being a country where there's a lot of littering. Other countries are terrible when it comes to littering and how they handle their trash. Uh, So that's a different issue than what's pushing this right now. And uh, also you should remember that there are going to be, there are a lot of loopholes in this and people are going to try to find other, you know, other ways. They start using like uh, garbage bags, which are much thicker than the plastic bags you usually get at a grocery store. They're going to use other things instead of, and sometimes those are even worse for the environment. So yeah, no, I, I, I hate littering. Um, I, I think that that's something that we should all be, you know, I hate littering. I also hate people that think it's okay to leave a little ding noise on their phones. I, I'm, I've come across an epidemic of people that also think that they can do, I was, I was, you know, I stayed at a hotel in LA and they had a little pool on the roof. And there's some guy who was obviously from like the UK and he sit there and he put, he was on FaceTime and he put it on speaker. So he's like, oh, he's like, I really like Los Angeles. He's having a great time here by the pool. I'm loving every second of it. I'm going to keep yelling on my phone. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, dude, you know, there's other people at the pool. Why? Why? Do, Producer Mark, I think you would even have to agree or oh, I'm going to ask course. you to agree that if you're in a public place, you don't get to be on speakerphone. People do it all the time. On all the, the train. Time. On the train. Uh, on the street. On the I train, mean, they do this. The People also thing, but... think they can, like, watch their video clips or whatever with the volume blasting Without headphones. Without headphones. What, what, what has but, to happen here, people? This is civilization is in the balance. I have something worse. What's that? This morning, I'm on the train on my way to the Freedom Hut. Yeah. And this guy, not only was he on the phone talking loudly, he started clipping his fingernails. That's disgusting. I looked That's at him disgusting. horrified. <laughs> like, I didn't disgusting. say anything because I didn't feel oh, like getting into a fight. Gosh. but. Oh, I don't know what I would do. That's so gross. It's not the first time I've seen it either. Like, yeah. people are disgusted. Yeah, I know. Whew. Like, how do you... Th- who thinks that's acceptable? Uh, I, there are people out there these days, man. I, I gotta tell you, it's... Uh, there's really... I really think that manners are in decline. I think that people just don't care about anybody around yes. them anymore. And we all have these devices that connect us to the people we do care about. And so the actual human beings in our vicinity get completely forgotten in favor of our connection to our our digital world. And I mean people that are that think that they're in speaker, I sat down to have breakfast at a hotel with, you know, my brothers, by the way, both my brothers came out to uh see the Bill Marshall with me. Thank God. I had a little bit of backup. I had I had the cavalry with me and, you know, we had fun. I mean, I think they were a little frustrated that I was uh, in a situation where I was just being cut off so much and not allowed to talk, which at some point, if you're just not being allowed to talk, there's only so much you'll be able to do. And uh, one funny story that I had for you is my brother, uh, my brother, when my older brother, when we were uh, backstage after the show, there's a little green room party for people that are on the Bill Maher show. He said, uh, you know, he said, hey, he's like, you know, isn't, isn't, uh, you know, James Woods is great on Twitter. He's like, you know, he'd be great on the show. Or he's like, you should have him on your show. Or, you know, we should hang out with him sometime. He, he brought up, he brought up, you know, James Woods, who is great on Twitter. And just out of nowhere, my brother. And I was like, yeah, yeah, James Woods, you know, he'd be cool. And, you know, I'll send him a DM and I'll tell him he should do my show on, on I'll send him a DM on Twitter. And this is, I didn't, I didn't even get a chance to tell producer Mark this. I'm in my hotel the next day and I step into the hotel uh, elevator. James Woods is in the elevator. I'm, I, wow. I, and ended up, he sent me a DM. I mean, I have the DM being like, great to meet you or whatever. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was, I mean, we now joke my older brother has some magic power, like he like manifest human beings. But he was just like, you know, it'd be cool. James Woods, either on this show or your show. I'm like, yeah, James Woods. He's like, yeah, you should like reach out. You should reach out to him. And I was like, yeah, sure. Did he like had seen him in the hotel maybe earlier that nope, day? Nope, wasn't really? staying in my hotel. Huh. Different hotel. Okay. No way. Ja- and James Woods lives in LA. So I asked him like, what are you doing in a hotel? He's like, oh, I'm, just, I'm going to an event. You know, I'm, I'm just, I wanted to be closer by so I don't have to worry about getting home. So yeah. So he was staying in my hotel, and my brother brought him up, and my brother wasn't in that hotel, and he obviously, you know, it was just crazy. Well, Buck, did you book him for the show? That's a good point. I should do that. Uh, I, I thought about yeah, it. I, I, was like, I was like, we should all go out drinking, and he was like, oh, well, you know, I got some cool James Woods. It's a cool Hollywood party to go to. Of course. All right.
righty. Stoney, keep on holding these moron left, uh, left chicken wings to the fire. You're a powerhouse. I'm concerned about China and the coronavirus being purposely used to affect our mission to get Trump reelected. Trump is hard on China and they can't take it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely what they're doing. I mean, they're trying to use coronavirus as a political weapon against Trump. And they won't put aside that, you know, they won't put aside what's best for the country, even for a moment here. They just, whatever's bad for Trump is what they're most concerned with. So that's troubling. And uh, we'll have to see. I don't know. I don't know if this is, look, I don't know if this is going to be a, a thing that we have to really worry about in the country for going forward. It could be a seasonal thing, or I don't know if this will kind of fade. I remember when I was in the Caribbean in, the, in Puerto Rico f- three, four years ago, and uh, people were, were panicked about Zika. And Zika ended up, remember that? And everyone's all, everyone's completely freaked out about microcephaly, having a small head. It's a genetic, uh, it's a, it's a genetic um, problem that happens if you can get Zika when you're, uh, when you're pregnant. So, you know, and, that, and now no one talks about Zika anymore. It just kind of went away. Uh, I don't even, SARS, MERS, there have been these other, coron- those are coronaviruses. Um, I think they should have come up with a better name, by the way. You know, why not just call it a crown virus? You know? The Corona Beer Company probably agrees with you. Yeah. You see that report over the weekend? Yeah, like yeah. 30 or 40% of people won't buy it. I beer. don't believe I think people are just like intentionally being stupid because yeah. they know it's a ridiculous poll. I don't think anyone's really that dumb. I think Corona's terrible beer either way. You know, I haven't had beer in so long that I can't even weigh in on this it, anymore. I don't even know. Like, I'll have it. But, what's, the go- you know. what's the go-to beer? Usually something like a Blue Moon. Blue Moon? Oh, it's, yeah. kind, of, it's kind of bougie. How does that you're kind of a You're kind of a bougie beer drinker. Belgian beer with a slice of orange in it? Yeah, I do like the orange. Do you... Do you uh, do you eat your finger sandwiches and and wear a top yeah. hat and a monocle well, while of you drink your blue moon beer? Yeah, this is your fancy beer. I thought you were gonna say Bud Light, like I an mean, American. Drink, if I'm drinking to you know, you know, having a party, I'll drink a Bud Light. But if I'm like enjoying a beer, I want a good one. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I I don't think I ever reached the point where I even really could tell all that much difference between beer. I was never really? much of a beer yeah. drinker well, even I before mean, this. Now really I can't it, anymore. Yeah. yeah. What I do like is cider. But cider is like you might as well just inject sugar directly into your veins. I yes. mean, a big a, like a a pint glass of cider is like 140 grams of sugar. It's horrible. And for you. if you drink too many, as well as you could hold any other alcohol, you can't hold your cider because of the sugar. Yeah, you get totally totally slammed. Mm. Uh, Jeremy writes, Buck, Disney has gone down in quality. It seems like hiring good writers is no longer important to making movies. Frozen is my daughter's favorite movie currently, so I've seen it many times. I will tell you that while Frozen has a weak plot, it is Citizen compa- a Citizen Kane compared to the train wreck that is Frozen 2. Dude, I believe you. Frozen is just not a good story. It's just not. Everyone gets, you know, people get mad at me for saying this. This is not a good story. Beauty and the Beast is like for, you know, mostly a, I think a, a movie for like little girls and like it's a good story and it's well executed. The, the old Beauty and the Beast from the 90s, the Disney movie was very well done. The music is good. Uh, what's it? Um, I was trying to think of uh, Gast- the Gaston song. I can't remember that. I, I wanted to start going Les Poissons, Les Poissons, but that's not Gaston, that's Poisson. You can't confuse Gaston and Poisson. It's that's kind not... of impossible to do. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, ro- oh, no one hits like yeah. that. There we go. I, I had to think of it. It took me a second. In a spitting match, nobody spits like that, you know? Mm-hmm. I feel like I could do it. You a- look a little bit like Gaston. <laughs> Uh, I'll take it. I'll he take it. He has more muscles. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, he's roughly the size of a barge. And sure. he does the, you know, that's what he says. So. I mean, like the swoop and everything. Yeah, no, he's got some swoop. Yeah, I mean, he just, you know, the problem is he just needed somebody to make him a good God-fearing conservative. He would have been all right. Instead, he was clearly a, clearly a lib, although he was about this. He did like the Second Amendment. but Are you doing that thing where you put politics in cartoons again? Yeah, I mean, it's all this, you know, this is what everybody does. Huh. Um, Jim writes... I love your show uh, because you take the time to research facts. Uh, regarding faith, face masks, you need to do a little more homework. Face masks, masks don't work if you have facial hair. No, no, Jim, I know that, but people don't, don't we're not at the point where we have to wear face masks. Um, that's the whole point. I'm not saying that it's not true that it's bad for it, but keep up the excellent work. Thank you, Jim. Brandon writes, Buck, thank you for holding your ground on Real Time with Bill Maher. I watched it to support you. Hopefully see some interesting discussion. They try to talk over you, and Bill Maher tried to shut you down, too. The hypocrisy of Maher talking about somebody who vilify, who disagrees with you and vilifying them 
is uh, it happened right on the show. It was hard to stomach. Yeah, man, I know. Next time, next time I'll probably just go uh, hard in the paint. And that'll be interesting. If they ever have me back, I think I think I just go uh, all in, all out, pulling the punches. Shield tie, everybody.